this presentation is we're going to look at rekindling those ecosystem interactions by patch barn grazing in the Texas Blackland Prairie. So, uh, for those of y'all who don't know, basically this region here in pink, uh, going from just south of the Red River, like I said, all the way down into Bear County, is the Texas Blackland Prairie. Historically, that would have represented anywhere from 12 and a half to 13 million acres of prairie land in one large uh, block. And now there's roughly 1% of 1% under permanent protection by federal, state agencies, uh, conservation organizations, et cetera. So roughly 13,000 acres is under long-term easement management, ownership, et cetera. Uh, and the bulk has either been converted or degraded from its natural use. So essentially as an ecosystem, it has been virtually eliminated uh, from, from the landscape. So where we have these fragments, um, they're usually relatively small and largely disjointed from other remnants. So there can become genetically isolated uh, individual species that use these usually don't have anywhere else to go. So when we find them, we try to document them, what's there, because uh, numerous times, even some of our professional staff don't know what the reference plant community for that particular area may look like for that soil type, for that slope position, um, for that rainfall band, et cetera, what a native prairie might even look like and what that plant assemblage might be. So to give an idea, we've got some descriptions, uh, you know, around the time of settlement from a couple of different folks in firsthand accounts. So this one was from Grayson County, there on the very northern edge of the Blackland Prairie in 1848 by John Brooke, who was an English immigrant. And he wrote, I can sit on my porch before my door and see miles of the most beautiful prairie, interwoven with groves of timber, surpassing in my idea the beauties of the sea. Think of seeing attractive land on a slight incline covered with flowers and rich meadow grass for 12 to 20 miles. And so I think this paints a really good picture of the Blackland Prairie as it is. It wasn't the expansive prairies of the Midwest where there may be treeless for 20 or 30 miles. These are usually hills or open expanses of meadows anywhere from a few dozen acres to a few thousand acres or maybe 10,000 acres intersected by the numerous uh, streams of the Trinity, the Brazos, the Colorado, the Guadalupe, rivers as they traverse their way across Texas from west to east on their trip to the Gulf of Mexico and all the tributary streams that go into that. So it was quite diverse. You had a lot of edge between woodland and prairie. Um, you had numerous different soil types throughout, usually class, uh, characterized by rich black clay loam or clay soils. Sometimes even clay pans are exposed to uh, bedrock of the parent material of limestone throughout. And so a couple of good descriptions came from Frederick Law Olmsted in 1856. Um, Y'all may recognize him. He's considered the father of landscape architecture, was actually the designer of Central Park in New York later on in life. But in 1856, he made a trip all the way from Nac Nacogdoches down to Piedras Negras down on the uh, uh, Rio Grande border. Uh, and as he did, he gave some excellent firsthand accounts of the people he saw uh, the, the landscape and what was on it and observations of the stock in the fields and so on. And so he was over near I-45 in Leon County, just a little east of Centerville around January 3rd of 1856. And he wrote this, he said, during the first part of the day, we went over small level wet prairies, irregularly skirted by heavy timber with occasional isolated clumps and scattered bushes. Most of the prairies have been burned over. Both yesterday and today, we've been surrounded by the glare of fires at night. The grass is coarse and reedy and exceedingly dry. We shot a few quails, which are very common, and saw several times turkeys and wild geese. Again, later on on his journey as he crossed the Navasota River near the modern day Brazos and Robertson County line here just north of where I live in College Station, it says near the Navasota, we rejoined the regular San Antonio Road and came out upon large open prairies with long and heavy skirts of timber. And this description applies to the whole region as far as the Colorado, the prairies as you proceed westward growing more and more extensive and the proportion of wooded land smaller. And then this description in his trip of the very southern end of the Blackland Prairie as he traveled from Seguin to Gonzales is one of my favorite descriptions of the tall grass prairie in Texas, uh, probably as it was ending its uh, rain as uh, being unplowed and relatively uh, unimpacted by continuous grazing. Just today, the genial sun warmed the fresh moistened soil and three or four more species opened into bloom. After this, hardly a day passed without some addition. 
talking about the increase, just the, a massive amount of diversity in these prairies there. You can hardly pass a day without a new species showing. And very soon it was impossible to welcome each newcomer. The whole bare prairies became radiant and delicious. The beauty of the spring prairies has never been and never will be expressed. It is inexpressible. A quick flush spread over all the bosom of old mother earth and it seemed to swell with life. In another day, the elm buds were green and bursting and the wild plum and fragrant blossom. The dreary burnt prairies from repulsive black changed at once to a vivid green, like that of a young wheat, the cheering effect I leave to be imagined. The herds all left the dry sedge and flocked to the new pastures. The young burnt districts covered with the thick mat of last year's growth were a month behind. So already in some of our thinking here, we're seeing the dynamics. He's recognizing the dynamics of play, how the fires interacted with the vegetation, how the grazing herds. He's not talking about bison in this case. Already it was wild cattle or free ranging cattle uh, in these locations that were being attracted to that first burned uh, grass and its, and its palatability relative to the thick mat of last year's growth where they weren't as attracted. So. With that, when we find these remnant prairies, we can see some of the descriptions of being erupting with life. This is here in Ellis County, a property that was burned in 2021. You can see just a rich floral display, at least 18 different species, 19 different species there in the picture. You can see some of the fire effects on that brush mod on top, how it's re-sprouting from the base, and there's numerous dead stems standing above it. Here, <clears throat> down in the southern portions of the Blackland Prairie, an interspersed mix of grass and various forbs, rattlesnake masters, snow on the prairie, and a skirt of timber there along the creek that drains from the uplands. Uh, just a look straight down and a look across at some of the diversity in these remnant prairies. We've got a lot large, large fruited primrose, uh, mimosas, little blue stem clumps from the previous year, coreopsis, Indian paintbrush, all sorts of things going on. Um, to even more grass dominated sites like this one here, also in the southern portion of the Blackland Prairie. Uh, and there's Jason Sinkhurst out there uh, doing some prairie preaching to, uh, to the folks within that. So we have a look at what some of these remnant plant communities may have been and how floristically and florally diverse they were at various times of year. Not only do we have a lot of species, but we have species filling different niches. Some are early bloomers, some are midsummer bloomers, some are late summer bloomers. There are always these floral resources available. And so as we have more of those different and varying plant species available, both annuals and perennials, we're able to attract additional suites of insects. And those additional suites of insects, of course, support all the different bird species that breed in this area. And so you can have species that love grasslands. You can have species that like more of a savanna, like this prairie that's being invaded by some cedar elms and honey mesquites and eastern red cedars that will probably get treated eventually. Uh, but just look at the floristic diversity. If I was a bee, a butterfly, I'd be pretty happy in all that mealy blue sage, uh, thistles, uh, twin leaf senna, and so on. Uh, and then in some places we have these rare plant communities where the plant material, the parent material of the blackland soils outcrops, and you've got these rocky limestone hills. And here you have less grass dominance. Uh, and you have a bunch of uh, forbs uh, that'll pop up and dominate these sites and even some locally endemic plants that are only found on these sites like Hall's, uh, Hall's uh, prairie clover. And so here in the foreground, we have a uh, compass plant with those deeply incised leaves uh, and just a whole host of others, New Jersey tea, Coreopsis species and so on. You see Barbara's buttons there in the background, the white flowers and even some yucca mixed in uh, there in the middle of your screen. So just rich floral diversity of these prairies. And this is a really good imagery from the Southern Blackland Prairie looking at big blue stem dominating this site. And you can see in the lower spots where the creeks and drainages go through how those woodlands would have been scattered around, particularly in the Southern portion of the Blackland Prairie where the live oaks start to creep in and make live oak savannas and live oak mots. Um, all those other hills now, unfortunately, are in Bermuda grass or Bahia grass or Johnson grass pastures. Uh, rather than uh, native grass, but you can see the interspersion of those habitats as they would have been historically across the landscape. Again, another look at Jason um, looking across this prairie remnant in the southern portion of the Blackland Prairie and some of the viewscapes you might have had looking up and over those slopes and how expansive those prairies may have looked if you were riding on horseback or on a wagon. And then, of course, the proverbial big blue stem taller than a man on a horse uh, this was this past October, again, in the southern Blackland. I'm about five foot nine, 
Uh, a lot of that grass is over six feet tall um, and it's hiding most of us pretty well um, within that system there in a big uh, growth of big blue stem that enjoyed all this summer's rainfall. So that's a look at what it may have looked like. Unfortunately, most of those remnants that we were looking at there are less than two dozen acres. Some of them are over 100 acres, but they're not anywhere close to the 13 million acres that would have been here historically. So we know that the historic drivers of the system, based on descriptions uh, from, from settlers' accounts and also just from general knowledge of what was happening, was drought, periodic grazing, and fire were the ones that shaped that plant community over a period of time. We saw that in Frederick Law Olmsted's writing there, and then many other resources that we have available to us. So the only one we really haven't uh, exhibited any control over in the last 150 years is really drought. We have no real control over that. Fire has essentially been eliminated from most of the landscape, which has allowed for grass and other perennial plants to take over in places and even uh, encourage brush encroachment or brush dominance in certain areas. And grazing has gone from these occasional events or high intensity short duration events to a lot of times continuous grazing pressure or um, maybe some rotational system and better managed systems. So we've lost a lot of those plant community dynamics that would have existed a long, uh, for a long period of time. Most of the Blackland Prairie has been converted to this, either being prepared for row crop production, um, cereal grains or annual pastures there in the background. So we may have single clumps like this big blue stem clump here on the roadside that exists by itself with no real connection to other uh, individuals of the same species or to a prairie system. Maybe it looks like this, just <laughs> I turned uh, 45 degrees to the left and you've got a bunch of brush encroachment from uh, hackberry trees and elm trees there uh, where it's been plowed under for corn and cotton production. And in the foreground, you've got some silver blue stem and old world blue stem, the non-native grasses coming in or uh, additional pressures along the Blackland Prairie because most of Texas's largest cities occur along that I-35 corridor, which is situated within the Blacklands. So you think of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, Waco, Austin, San Antonio, and so on, um, are all situated basically where these major river systems either arose for the Trinity or where the Brazos, Colorado, or San Antonio River um, arose out of the hill country and other drier areas to the west and opened up onto these Blackland prairies. So, Occasionally, you'll come across this, which is the opposite direction of those last few pictures, which is a prairie restoration that we did. Um, but even there, just four to five years ago, that was in row crop production too. So the Blackland Prairie has been heavily impacted either from full-on conversion or, as in this picture, um, heavily impacted by continuous grazing. You can see there's literally no uh, residual vegetative cover from the previous year. You can see brush encroachment from mesquite marching across that landscape being thicker in some places and other places not. As to where historically this would have been a wide open prairie uh, based on the soil types of about 20 to 25,000 acres in size uh, with two large creeks flanking it on the north and south. And so my good friend and fellow biologist, Jay Whiteside, who's the technical guy biologist up there in Ellis and Navarro County, um, Basically, we put our heads together and try to think, okay, what can we do? We know full scale restoration is really expensive and not financially feasible for a large number of folks. Uh, we know that our incentive programs have a limited budget and we can only plant maybe 1500 acres a year back to Prairie. So just to get 100,000 acres would take us about uh, 70 years. Um, we need to try to look at some of this degraded land and see if there's a way that we can change a something simple and try to put it back to a better state. It's not going to be the state it was in pre-settlement. It's not going to be 1850s prairie, but can it fulfill the hydrologic cycles, the soil carbon cycles, um, the soil health, the rainwater infiltration, and the wildlife needs by doing one, one or two things to adjust what's currently happening uh, that is feasible for an individual landowner to pull off. And so what we came to after a lot of reading from uh, Sam Fullendorf and Dwayne Elmore out of Oklahoma State University, from Chris Helzer with the Nature Conservancy out of Nebraska, from the Great Plains Fire Science Exchange and their usefulness that they have with all their publications, 
we really liked some of the things we were seeing from patch burn grazing, both with the effects that they had shown for lesser prairie chickens and bobwhite quail, but also some of the plant community dynamics for some of the uh, perennial prairie species that we really wanted to favor that in those continuous grazing systems were being hit continuously and pretty hard to where they weren't able to reproduce on a regular basis. So what is the goal? Do we want something that looks like this where you burn it and all the grass is hammered and you just have a few things popping up that the cows really don't like to eat? Uh, do we want it to be this diverse and full of uh, tall vegetation of various flowering plants? Do we want it to look like this, you know, grazed down and then rested for a long period of time where it all recovers uniformly? Uh, do we want it to look this juxtaposition where we have virtually no management on the backside and everything stick tall grass and on the front end is uh, diverse, um, diverse but heavily impacted? And the answer is we wanted all those things. We want them all in close proximity on the same habitat patch of reasonable size. Um, so a whole bunch of different species can use those things that they need at the times they need them, uh, and they can make those decisions. So we don't treat the whole pasture the same. So what is patch burn grazing? And basically what it is, is you're using fire at different times and scales to shift grazing pressure. So what do you accomplish by doing this? It allows for the production of quality livestock forage, you're controlling woody encroachment, and you're creating structural diversity in vegetation which meets the needs of multiple wildlife species. And so the Cornell Lab of Ornithology wrote, wrote this out really well. And it says grassland ecosystems are dependent on periodic disturbance for habitat maintenance. As a result, management of grassland areas is best directed towards the creation of a mosaic of grassland habitat types. This habitat mosaic is probably best maintained through some type of rotational management system in which sections of large grassland areas receive management on a regular schedule. Such a rotational system would provide a variety of habitat types in every year, would ensure the availability of suitable habitat for birds at either end of the grassland management spectrum. So those who prefer short vegetation and sparse vegetation and those who prefer tall and dense vegetation all the way from top to bottom. And also would provide habitat for birds whose preferences lie between these extremes. So our goal was we needed to provide more usable space. So we want nesting, brood rearing, and screening cover for quail and other bird species in close enough proximity where they can use those. We want habitat patches of multiple habitat types in a single location, which allows for use by all those species. We need foraging locations for all these things. So we need bare ground, which is favorable for granivorous birds like morning doves, uh, various invertebrates. So you're thinking about insects here. Some prefer sunny, sunny areas, some prefer shady and moist, some prefer tall vegetation, some prefer short vegetation, some prefer only members of the aster family, some prefer only members <clears throat> of, of the uh, sage or the mint family, and so on. And so we also know that those pollinators need lots of different things as well. So we need annual plants, we need perennial plants, we need short duration blooming species, ephemeral spring species, and also long blooming species to really fill all these niches we're talking about. And this also is gonna help provide germination opportunities for those that aren't doing well right now on those either heavily impacted gray systems or those areas that are rested too much and are too grass dominated. So it's gonna open up that root and light space with less competition for moisture and nutrients as they get established. Essentially taking a, uh, a monoculture, opening up light and space through burning and grazing and allowing for greater diversity to replace that over a period of time. Basically showing the same thing here that's showing its grazing pressure increases, root space, root uh, amounts decrease, which basically opens up the ability for other species to, to germinate. Anybody who's been in the Blackland prairies has seen this. If, when it gets to that far right standing, when it gets grazed really hard, you have a huge abundance of annual plants uh, like single seed croton, western ragweed, annual sunflower, uh, snow on the prairie, and so on. So. The usefulness for us with this patch burn grazing is, whereas the traditional model of range management, which is the even distribution of moderate animal impact across the sites, might optimize sustainable livestock production objectives, it might not be sufficient for the maintenance of plants and animals that require habitat conditions different from those created by moderate grazing animal impact. So species whose needs are best provided either by heavily or lightly impacted rangelands. And that's from an Oklahoma State study um, that they did that's listed here at the bottom of this page. So some rangeland wildlife species require markedly different habitats at different times during their life cycle. So they may not like the same thing. Uh, they may need different things at different times of the year. 
So if entire landscapes are measured the same with those moderate impacts evenly across all the management units, you're not going to really maximize your production of those species or the ability for them to use those sites. So the ability of rangelands to provide habitat for wildlife and enhance biodiversity values will often depend on the ability of land managers to simultaneously optimize the production values of livestock with those values and objectives associated with production of those wildlife. So what did they find when they did, looked at cattle performance? Basically, there was no difference between where they did pasture run grazing and those who used normal, um, normal range management intensities. So there was no detrimental impact that they could find um, from doing these things. And you also had the added benefit of potentially having brush control and increased wildlife beyond that. So other benefits for private landowners who may decide to use pasture run grazing is maybe less infrastructure. So an estimated cost of a fence, whether you just buy the material and do it yourself or pay somebody just for a five strand barbed wire fence, these are very, uh, maybe these may even be low. These are a few years old, these numbers. But for a quarter mile fence, if you use $3 a foot, you're still paying almost $4,000 for a quarter mile fence. If you got $7 per foot, you're at almost 9,300. Um, not only are you paying that expense, but now you've got maintenance. So if you have trees falling, if you got rough cows that are busting wires, if you've got problems <clears throat> like that deal on the right where you may have wildlife impacts you don't intend on having, um, those can all be issues. And again, by burning, we get rid of some of these brush issues you may have, invasion by eastern red cedar there on the bottom left, cedar realm, honey locust, all those things that invade these old pastures when left alone. We satch in the southern Blackland prairies, um, mesquite across almost the entire Blackland Prairie that can be an issue. You can address a lot of these with this fire and still have all those other benefits that you're looking to have. In addition, by concentrating some of that grazing load, um, you can have parasite reduction. So instead of having uniform impact across sites um, where you're having some of these, uh, you know, take for instance, horn fly larvae and things like that, that a lot of those pupate in cow pets, you know, in the cow pies themselves. And so if you're concentrating that in all one portion of the property, not only are you getting a lot of nutrient cycling in one particular area, we can also concentrate things like dung beetle activity and things such as that because it can help break those down faster um, to where maybe those horn flies aren't able to complete their life cycle as quickly. Uh, maybe you're able to, by burning, able to get rid of some of those tick, <coughs> uh, tick egg, you know, egg masses and things like that, or even burn up the ticks themselves if you don't have some of these issues that could result in reduction of cattle performance. So what are some important considerations when you're looking at doing these patch burn grazing? Um, stocking rate is going to be huge. Know the productivity of your soil. Um, know your rainfall. Know the primary productivity of the soil types that you have and what they're capable of producing. Um, some folks need the income uh, really strongly. So that may influence how many cattle they have to have. Uh, and you need to monitor the impact on the vegetation and the resources as you're doing this. Uh, but the nice thing is it really provides some flexibility on your burn size and your team timing and frequency, how often you can move the cattle, your ability to respond to drought, ability to respond to abundant rainfall, and whether you're going to do this on a single pasture on an entire property. And one of the most important things is how long to rest these, these areas after you've done grazing them. So um, stocking rate can have the greatest impact on your results. Again, it's highly variable, and it's probably going to vary year to year if you're really watching what you're doing. So there is no ma magic number, but you're trying to minimize your impact outside of the burn zone and maximize the impact in the burn zone. So that rest period allows those perennial grasses and forbs to recover. Um, it's going to be impacted by climate when it goes to rest. It may need more if you enter a dry cycle. It may be shorter and recover really quickly if you hit a wetter cycle or that with good rainfall. Um, heavier grazing pressure is generally going to equal a longer rest. So with all that as our basis for what we're talking about here, we're looking at this site right on the Navarro Ellis County line. Um, those hatch marks that you see kind of in the middle of that yellow polygon are basically where we burn. And so essentially what we did was we decide, okay, this particular landowner and numerous other landowners in the area, we're not going to change anything other than adding burning to their management cycle. So essentially these are two 240 acre pastures on either side of that split in the middle from the yellow and black there. 
And we're going to try to burn a third of each pasture each time to attract the cattle to that area and hopefully rest the other areas from grazing to allow them to recover over time. Uh, and we were going to measure these changes uh, and we'll go a little deeper into how we're going to measure that uh, and assess some different things uh, here a little bit later. So, essentially, this was the day of the first burn, February 19th, 2015. So we're looking right across uh, from, the, from the east pasture to the west pasture where we had already burned that west pasture that morning. Uh, and we're going to be burning the east pasture. And you can see this place was heavily, heavily impacted. Um, we basically had to drop almost 20 gallons of burn fuel on 80 acres to get it to burn because there was so little residual forage available um, for us to burn on it. And you can see from what we had burned those that morning, those cattle were already moving into that burn unit uh, to see what was there and what they could get their mouths on. They were immediately attracted to it. So it was kind of a good sign for us that this might work. So basically we, we looked at it and we looked at it, looked at it and we looked at it and we looked at it trying to determine how are we going to measure this quickly and effectively with meaningful results. And basically what we came up with was a method that had been used in other parts of the Midwest uh, called Floristic Quality Analysis or Floristic Quality Inventory. And essentially uh, what we used was a model based out of the Platte River Prairies where they did a plot-wise Floristic Quality Inventory. So we've got randomly placed uh, meter square plots and we're essentially documenting every species within that plot over time to assess how many species, or species richness, essentially, how many species are occurring within those. And we can determine over time, uh, are we seeing increases or decreases? Is the plant community moving towards higher seral state species? So are we seeing more big blue stem, more liatris, more prairie clovers? Are we seeing more of what was there when we started, which was a lot of annual plant species uh, and not a lot of grass, honestly. Um, and, and those that were tolerant, more tolerant of heavy grazing. And so it's a real quick and dirty technique. And essentially each of these plant species has a conservatism score assigned to it. We were lucky that the Nature Conservancy in Texas already had about 90% of what we encountered had a conservatism score associated with it. And we're able to use those values to try to get some scores. Um, so we measured a lot of this. Uh, we would measure in mid July. And that was to capture most of the warm season plants that were actively growing, but also to try to capture some of those cool season plants that weren't quite through. Almost every year we still run into blue bonnets and Indian paintbrushes and various other cool season plants that are still blooming in the middle of July when we do this. Typically we do it anywhere from July 6th to as late as July 20th uh, when we do our sampling. And so, <clears throat> as you said, we looked at it close, then we looked at it a little closer, then closer yet, and then really close. And so we're assessing all those species within that square and trying to determine not percent covers, but just what's occurring within those and already moving the direction we want to. Uh, and we found a couple of things that we'll talk about in a little detail here. Basically, uh, we had lots of folks who wanted to help and come out and do the fire uh, when we were doing these burns. We got good participation from the Western Navarro Bob White Restoration Initiative uh, to come out. Because uh, it's fun to light other people's land on fire and not your own. And so we had some really good burn days out there. We got a lot of folks experience doing prescribed fire and hopefully encourage some of them to do it on their own properties uh, for the benefits it provides for them. Uh, here's Jay. Um, in this particular year, I believe this was in 2017, uh, you can see we were able to burn that east pasture, which is there in the background about three weeks earlier than we were able to burn the west pasture. And you can see it's already greened up and how those cows have concentrated it in that burn unit. And here we are burning the west pasture. And I believe this was its second burn um, that was occurring in that, in that field that year. So essentially year one, <clears throat> burning it there on the top left, uh, you can see it's getting the, the after effects there on the bottom right. Uh, and then two months later, the cattle are in that burn unit grazing heavily on that fresh green forage where they can. And so it became evident really quickly the effect that those burns were having on that plant community. One, you can tell here that that uh, burn lane is basically right down the middle of the picture there, kind of uh, sinuous and going from left to right on your screen. And you can see the fresh burn on the left and then last year's growth on the right as we're conducting some of the sampling in that first year. 
So there's Jason and Jay and Dan Jones, who's now since retired, as we do some of the initial inventory work that first season. And so after that first year, this ground had been so beat up when Jay and I got through, any of y'all have seen Lonesome Dove, we felt like old Pete after he'd walked across the prairie, getting away from the Comanches and the Kiowas was uh, with bare feet. I mean, we were beat up. That ground was hard as a rock. It was pitted with cattle tracks uh, throughout from when it had been wet earlier in the year. Um, and our ankles and knees were actually swollen from walking across it. So we were like a couple of different things. One, we knew the vegetation wasn't where we wanted it. We knew the plant community wasn't quite what we wanted it to be. And we figured this soil is in bad shape. And so we're interested to see what happened over time. And so this was sunset on that first day of sampling. So even though our feet and legs were swollen, we knew there was potential here. <clears throat> this fire could hopefully get rid of all of those mesquites that were invading this prairie and that hopefully we could bring it back to some level of sustainability and uh, improvement over a period of time. So this was the methodology we used for those who were interested. Uh, that's the, the link to the research paper that um, the Prairie Ecologist blog, if any of you are familiar with that, with Chris Elzer from the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska that he put out and we based a lot of our assumptions and work on. Uh, we use those meter square spots where we listed all the species we wanted to compare over time. We use those nature conservancy derived conservatism values, and we want a long term comparison of burned versus unburned and frequency data. So what we wanted to do with this is do more than two years of sampling, which is a typical master's project. So we've sampled 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 and 21. So we've got seven years of data and we're hoping to go two more years where we see three burn cycles on each parcel that we've partitioned when we burn our thirds and get that information and hopefully um, do a deep dive into that information long term. So this is some of the information that we compiled up for the first year. If you look at the east pasture, you can basically see Desmanthus Leptolobus, that's prairie bundle flower, uh, Bromus catharticus, that's Japanese brome, an exotic species, Croton, uh, the Croton species there is single seed Croton, Amphiochorus, that's broomweed, Euphorbia bicolor, that's snow on the prairie, Gallardia pichella, that's uh, Indian blanket, Nicella leucotrica. So we finally got a grass, seven species down, and it's only half the plots, and that's Texas winter grass, uh, which is the dominant in, in July, which is in a typical prairie system for these soils. It should have been little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, and so on as the dominance, and they're not showing up. Uh, Sporobulus combosum. Compositus is meadow drop seed is another one. That's usually, if that's dominant, it's telling us that there's been heavy continuous grazing pressure here. So we don't really start getting into better warm season grasses until you get down near the bottom, those first 15, 20 species. Eriochloa cerisia, that's Texas cupgrass, Budalua curtipendula, that's Cytoscroma. So now we're getting some better grasses. So we're hoping long term, can we see that increase over time? So beyond those grass species, we were finding lots of inverts. Uh, we we're getting lots of uh, primary productivity from our Forbes species that weren't super abundant before. So Indian blankets, spreading bladder pod, Maximilian sunflower there in the, in the center of the photo, uh, purple prairie clover and compact clip peri clover, which you only got, um, Dahlia eniandra, which is big top, or nine anther dahlia, which is more of a rolling plain species, which is coming out all the way into these prairie systems. Uh, big response from American basket flower, great seed producer and good pollinator plant. Um, and then the other thing we started to see was the limited big four grasses that were actually out there. Once we started concentrating that grazing pressure by burning portions of this property, the big four grasses were actually able to produce seed. So here for the first time uh, in year two, we were actually seeing big blue stem being able to throw up a few scattered seed heads here and there to make seed and try to propagate itself and keep itself going. Here you see <clears throat> the Cytos grama and little blue stem maybe able to start lifting their heads up in some of these burn units after they've been rested. So here's a big stand of uh, Cytos grama in uh, flower there. It's kind of hard to tell, but all that kind of yellowish stuff is all the mature seed on the top of the grass there. And so the burning is encouraging seed production. The increased nutrient cycling by count Concentrating the cattle grazing those lo those locations is probably adding additional nutrients to those grasses as they're trying to seed. And then when they get a period of rest and we burn the other pastures, they're able to uh, regrow their roots, improve their overall stability on the ground, and improve so uh, their soil coverage and productivity. 
And so even switchgrass and a few drainages where we hadn't seen it before, uh, that was year three before we found that. And we were also getting some effects on honey mesquite. So you can see this was a top killed honey mesquite from the fire. It's got a little re-sprout here down on the bottom. We were able to top kill that and reduce the vegetative impact or the, the mesquite impacts across that prairie. And so we started attracting more people out there. And the other thing was a great classroom for people to learn about what we were doing and the dynamics of those plants to take back to the landowners that they were assisting with. So here we've got, uh, I believe that's Jay in the foreground there on the left, uh, Jason Singhurst, Heidi Krieger. Uh, that was an intern, Obed, I believe his name was that year for Jason, myself, and Matt Mahashek, who's worked for Grazing Land Coalition at that time, uh, and so on. And so, as we said, we knew those cattle were being attracted to those grazing, uh, to those burned areas. Uh, and so it allowed, these were those areas after they were allowed to rest, we were finally getting good reproduction from those uh, big time warm season grasses, just a nice stand of big blue stem regrowing after being out of the burned area, just looking really fine right there and producing a ton of seed. And so from the examples we had seen prior to starting, this is from Chris Elzer and the work he did with Nature Conservancy along the Platte River. In 2007, this is what his patch burn grazing looked like after three years of grazing. And so when he rested it for two years and gave it a fire, it, was, it came back like that. So we're like, I don't know if we have anything that dynamic because we don't have uh, quite the sweetest species that they do up there. Um, but it was still pretty good. We had documented at this time up, upwards of 175 species of plants on that particular pasture. So this was burned in uh, January of 2017, January and February 2017. And that's Jay Whiteside on the left and Taylor Garrison on the right um, within the burn unit. You can see the cattle right there in the back concentrated in the burn unit. And around their feet is a ton of Western ragweed. Um, and so around that Western ragweed, you, you can see it's mainly non-palatable annual forbs that are around them. And if you look at their feet, is a bunch of heavily grazed grass. And so uh, here we laid down a grazing stick from the NRCS, and you can kind of see how exposed it is. But there's lots of good seed-producing forbs here. So prairie petunia, agalina species, snow on the prairie, American basket flower, single seed croton, and a host of others mixed in within that. There's some <clears throat> broomweed. Uh, I'm sure there's some desmanthus in there and some primrose that we're not seeing right now. Uh, even some prairie dotter growing across there, uh, and uh, uh, Texas wintergrass. And so there's another spot within the burn unit. It looks pretty hammered. You know, if I went out there without knowing any better, I'd say they need to take the cattle off. But essentially, all we did, we added no fences. We didn't change the grazing uh, duration. We didn't change the grazing stocking rate. We let the landowner do exactly what he was doing. We just started burning a third of the pasture each year. Uh, two years later, this was a recovery. So if you go back and look at this photo from 2017, you can see I circled that tree in the back. You see here in 2019, that same tree, uh, Jay is now standing next to flowering big blue stem there in the middle of July. Still lots of floral diversity, but look at that grass coverage and how it recovered. You hardly see any Western ragweed mixed in. Um, the grass was able to reassert its dominance from that period of rest when we burned and focused that grazing pressure in other places. And so he's standing in roughly 18 to 20 inches of grass, uh, uh, thick, not relatively thick, it's just fairly open in certain spots within there, but relatively thick, 18 to 20 inches of grass. Uh, and the cattle are in that pasture and they're not grazing it uh, because they're concentrating on that burned area. So here we're able to see it <clears throat> basically recover from that heavy grazing period it had two years previous. There you see that same meter stick laid down at Jay's feet near the same area, and you can barely see it laying in there. Uh, so what we found over time was, you know, we could burn these areas and they would get hit really hard. Uh, but even six years on, so we six sampling seasons, so we started in 2015, so it's five years, six sampling seasons. This particular unit was burned in 2018. You can see this crest of the hill up here and that slope. In the same spot, here's Jason, and it's the first time we picked up pitcher sage, salvia zeria, um, in July of 2020, five years after walking through that field doing 100 plots. Um, and we noted every species we saw, whether it showed up in the plot or not. Uh, but it's looking really diverse during that time of rest. You can see there's some ironweed back here, lots of American basket flower already going to seed. Uh, pitcher sage, this is a huge colony of big blue stem coming down this slope. 
um, is really recovering well and a completely different look from what we had seen in 2015 when there was hardly any residual cover where we could barely get a fire to carry. So do I have final data for you? Unfortunately, no. So we're long on sampling and short on evaluation time, unfortunately. So we're still compiling some numbers. We don't have full conservatism values for all plants aside because assigned because there is some disagreement for a few of those plants that could lead to big swings in the scores overall. So we continue to evaluate those data sheets and organize them and hope to release additional evaluation data over the next few years about those results as we finish up. We're really hoping to have that full nine year data set, <clears throat> which would be this year's sampling season and the next and will be complete. So 2023. Um, we plan on continuing that to finish all three of those burning cycles and we can analyze the treatments for all pasture and see are there interactions between where we burned and we didn't. Did these higher seral state grasses we're trying to focus on those big four were they always found in the same locations or were they starting to move around the prairie and expand the, from where they were when we started in 2015 and so on. So our observational conclusions are these. Pasture burn grazing is another tool in the toolbox. It is not the answer for everyone. But in this particular case where we had a degraded system that had a limited amount of invasive species, uh, roughly less than 10 to 15% uh, King Ranch blue stem and concentrated in a few places, um, not a monoculture, it was effective at doing what we want to do, seeing a change in the overall structural diversity. It can achieve effects that fire alone and grazing alone cannot. That interaction between the two is key. It also achieved almost all of our secondary goals, brush control, parasite control, minimizing wildfire risk, promoting biodiversity. The amount of bird life that has increased on this prairie over the period of time that we've been out there is incredible. There were always shrikes, there were always grasshopper sparrows, there were always meadow larks. But I would say the numbers have increased anywhere from two to five fold, depending on the species. We found our first metal and lark nest while sampling this year. A couple of years ago, there wasn't enough residual vegetation cover for those metal larks to even make a nest in that field, except for in a few locations. Um, it's increased the usable space for all of those species and all the insects that are out there. Um, cattle production has stayed the same. The landowner is very pleased with what has occurred. He seems he seems to think that. Uh, cattle production has stayed the same or maybe even slightly improved as a result of these practices over time. Uh, the other thing that we noticed is when we first started, if we got a two or three inch rain within a week or two of when we started, it was highly likely that somebody might get stuck out on this prairie. This past year in 2021, there was a two and a half or three inch rainfall event two days before we got out there and there weren't any puddles. Water infiltration has gone up tremendously. We don't have any direct measures uh, of that because we are trying to keep it. It's all those things in hindsight that you wish you had measured previously. But after a three inch rain event, there were no puddles on the ground relative to the neighboring properties that were continuously grazed where you could see puddles between all of the berms, ditches, um, any any area where water could pond. It was ponded on neighboring properties, but not on this particular one uh, where a lot of this had been going on for a period of time. The landowner even said he had to dig an extra pond in that pasture because the amount of runoff he was getting wasn't significant enough anymore to keep his other two ponds full enough for the cattle utilizing that property. So he had to enlarge and deepen them uh, because he wasn't getting as much runoff when rainfall events did occur. So in result, um, maybe not as much for the quail because they're kind of uh, widespread and sparse in those areas, but there's been more wildlife in the field relative to what was happening out there previously, simply by adding the addition of fire to that grazing system. So with that, I'd like to thank Mr. Beeson, who's allowed to do this research out on his property, and all the samplers who have assisted, Jay Whiteside, Taylor Garrison, Heidi Krieger, Bobby Alcorn, Matt Mahashik, Dan Jones, Charlie Booher, Obed Rodriguez, Jason Singers, and all the Winbury landowners and volunteers for their time, and of course, myself for um, all the stuff we've done out there. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions you may have. And I'll quit sharing the screen so we can get back to the question and answer side. So awesome, Tim. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation and your research. Um, and it's been a treasure to assist you and Jay and a lot of our staff and other volunteers in this project. Um, yeah, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, if you don't mind sticking around for a couple more minutes. Oh, yeah, um, go for it. Tim. Um, Let's start out here. 
um, from Brooke Best of the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. Says when you say year two, do you mean 2017? It says a parentheses since burn was early 2015, like two years since burn. So two years of rest because 2015, which was the year of burn, would have been the year that it would have been grazed. <clears throat> and so that two year period is it, we burned a new patch in 2016, another patch in 2017. So two years since burn, two years of essential rest for that pasture uh, after that point is what I was talking about there. So awesome. Okay, um, from Bill Kirby, um, did you do anything to try to control invasives such as King Ranch Bluestone, Bermuda, Bahia, et cetera, <laughs> Johnson Crest, et cetera? And that's a great question. So if we were doing a full true restoration, I would say yes, that would be something that we would definitely be geared up on. This particular landowner and, and, and a bunch of the folks would do is trying to control those things and replant is extremely expensive. So our goal for this particular project was to do one thing, just add fire and adjust that grazing pressure. So it could have been additional fencing, it could have been these burns, uh, but just simply adding the rotational system helped out a lot. There is King Ranch Blue Stem on these sites. There is Bermuda grass, particularly around the barn where he feeds hay. Uh, Bahia grass really isn't an issue on these clay type soils. Uh, but there is scattered Johnson grass. It's very, very sparse, you know, just a few plots here and there. But right around the barn, I'd say there's probably an acre that is impacted by Bermuda out of the 240 acre pasture. And King Ranch is probably spread out across anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of that pasture. But again, rarely in monoculture. And the management through the burning and grazing is keeping its structure such that I don't feel it has as much of an impact as it would otherwise. So it's one of the things we're hoping to see is like, are we seeing King Ranch Blue Stem increase, decrease based on what we're doing? We just haven't had, I haven't had the ability to analyze all of that information fully to, to give an answer without potentially saying something that isn't true. So I'd rather draw no conclusions than an incorrect, correct conclusion for this presentation. This is a part of myself too. I need to come over to your office when to start questioning this data, but anyway, um, um, let's see, Evelyn Mertz down in Houston uh, area. Did you use a particular method to determine whether the meter square sampling areas, oh, where the meter square sampling areas were located? We did. Um, es essentially, we did not use fixed plots. We wanted to measure um, truly random areas throughout and assess what was occurring across all areas and not just where we were sampling year over year. So it's not a, it will not be a direct comparison of a single plot over a period of nine years. What it will be is a sampling of the same general area, um, relatively speaking, uh, because this is a working ranch. We couldn't put 100 pin flags out every year and, and all that sort of stuff. So basically, it went like this. We knew that's a 240-acre pasture. We knew we wanted 100 sampling points um, to make sure we could basically get the noise out of the data and have something that actually meant something, some data that actually meant something. So we uh, divided that into uh, 2.4 acre squares, which is essentially one hectare. And <coughs> that grid, Jay and I both have a forestry background. So if you know forestry, you know you can measure things in chains. And so uh, 24 square chains, which is six by four, gives you a hundred plot grid. And so we basically start in a different corner every year, do a random number generation, march in that far, and then start our between plots is four chains along a certain given azimuth uh, as we march through. And then between chains, is, it's supposed to be six chains uh, between uh, transect lines that those points are on as well. And so that's how we selected those. Um, so relatively random along those transect points Basically, one per hectare is how we how we selected those. Fantastic, Tim. Very explicit on that uh, answer to that question. Um, how long were your average periods of rest? Any recommended timings? So, for this particular pasture, again, we're in, that area is almost in a 35, 40 inch rainfall belt, um, with which, which is fairly uniform. I think even in 2011, most of the areas, most of those areas, still received about a foot of rainfall at least uh, during that historic drought. Um, and one period during this, um, we were up there for a meeting talking about what we were doing, 
It rained 22 inches in an afternoon. It's at a record up there, it knocked trains off the railroad tracks and everything else. It was an incredible rainfall event. Um, but typically we were just going on that three year rotation again. I don't know that that's optimal. If we, we would have loved to have had greater control over grazing pressure during periods of when it was too wet, maybe we would like more cattle. When it was too dry, maybe we could have taken the cattle off a little sooner. But I think this was about as real world as it gets. All we did was burn, and we had no other control over anything else that happened out there. Um, and so I don't know how directly applicable this can be to other properties from a, if you do this, this will happen. But it's great from an observational standpoint of there are probably, Jason can correct me here, but I would say somewhere between 30 and 75,000 acres of these just degraded black land parcels that are invaded Absolutely. by brush or overgrazed. And there's way more of that than there are remnants. And if we could get those going in the right directions like this one is, then you can start talking about having maybe a functional type system uh, where you could get some of those ecosystem services that currently aren't functioning now. But for our typical rest period right now is two years and then it's burned again. Yeah, I agree. There's, uh, we, we mapped about 70,000 acres of remnants um, in the counties within the Black and Prairie region. It's probably about double that of the kind of landscape you're talking about that can lend itself to the stuff restoration. Okay. Um, shout out from Katie Crispin. Great presentation. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, to Tim. Uh, to Tim. Um, Rob Carr, uh, was the soil tested during this duration? If there's any soil testing done, I'll call that. Uh, so, Rob, so no, the soil is not tested. That was one of the things that hindsight we're like, we wish we had tested a couple of different things. One, infiltration, infiltration rates when we started versus now, rainfall infiltration. Uh, we also wish we had tested soil carbon when we had started versus now, uh, as well as testing bacteria versus fungi in the a microbial plant community to see did that change over time with the introduction of that extra carbon and nitrogen cycling from the cow waste, from the additional input of burning that vegetation and so on. Um, we may be starting another one, foolishly, because <laughs> we don't have enough going on, uh, a different property. And we've already talked about trying to measure some of those and figure out how we pay for it and all those types of things. Um, I did see one that says, we live next to land, next to Lake Ray Hubbard. I was over the last year, found over 100 native plants to respond. Vegetation seems to change over the years. How do we know what its original habitat is and how could we manage it so that it best moves to original natural habitat? So that is a question that's usually going to be tied to your soils. Um, and I gave a presentation on this for another webinar series we do called the Plant Party about indicator species. So if you have some of those higher seral state plants there, so these, um, I think Big Blue Stem is example, Rattlesnake Master, uh, some of the Liatra species, some of the rare milkweeds, um, those types of things, those can be indicators that that was, maybe it's unplowed or maybe the relic plant community is somewhat intact. Uh, you can look at that. You can also use web soil survey and map out those areas and it should give you a rough idea of what could have been expected in those areas. It's not 100% accurate, uh, but it can give you some information there as well. A lot of times if it's Corps of Engineer land, they'll have done an environmental assessment beforehand and you can oftentimes find those um, and they'll have detailed information on what occurred there historically, uh, both from the natural resources and the cultural resources, um, depending where you're at. And Tim, let's note too, there are questions in the chat as well as the Q&A. So, um, let's see, let's wrap up the Q&A. Um, back up here. So um, gonna, the conservation score system, where can additional information be found? So uh, if, if they email me, um, I'll put my email here in the chat. If they email me, I can send them what I have. But essentially, it's a link uh, that Bill Carr and Jim Edson from the Nature Conservancy helped put together way back in like 2005 or seven. Um, and then we encountered numerous species that weren't on that list. So Jason, myself, Jay Whiteside, and Taylor Garrison, we kind of put some scores together um, for those species based on our experience. Uh, Jay, almost two decades, Jason, over two decades, myself, a little over a decade, 
and Taylor, I think, are getting close to a decade for him as well. Um, we feel fairly confident in those. And really, it's just about establishing enough. If everybody uses those same numbers, then it becomes comparable. Um, but essentially, let's take uh, take like single seed croton. You can find that in a remnant prairie. You can also find it on a roadside that just got graded for a new interstate. Um, so that would be like a one. You'll find it anywhere. It's disturbance dependent. It just shows up. Then maybe you have like a comet milkweed, you know, Asclepius rotiflora. Well, that one may be like a six or seven because you're not going to find that on a scrape roadway. You're more likely going to find it in a relatively well managed prairie or some semblance of a native system. Um, to give you an example of that. Uh, uh, yeah, Tim, we're in the Q and A too. There are three last questions. I know we've gone over about a minute over, but um, if you don't mind, we'll. Answer these yeah, three I'm good for it. Go. Okay. Uh, will any seed for missing species be introduced, or will you, the landowner, continue to just rely on the seed bank to regenerate? As of now, yeah, as of now, uh, maybe long term they will, but for now, again, we were trying to do it as cheap as possible, introduce one management technique, see the results. And so no additional seed has been added so far, with the exception of. He did have one bag of seed that he had had from a previous project. He had done another portion of his property and he spread it out in some of his fire breaks um, afterwards. So we had some Indian grass pop up uh, in some of his fire breaks uh, over the last few years. But other than that, no, no additional broadcasting seed um, over large areas or anything such as that. Okay. Oops, something pop up there. Uh, does the landowner want to expand the P sorry, PBG? From batch graze to rest the rest of his property, the ranch. Pretty so right. he would, but essentially he's relying relying on us to burn it for him every year. And we aren't willing to expand our reach on his land, which is outside of this research area, because we don't want to take away from private contractors who may be doing that. And it takes away from us from being able to burn our own lands or help other landowners too, um, as they manage their properties. But no, he's a huge fan of it. He, He's very much supportive of what we've done on his on his properties. I think this is going to be a quick answer to this next question. Um, are the cattle free to access the resting areas the whole time? Yes, there is there is no cross fencing. Basically, the only thing keeping them on the burned areas are the fact it was burned. They have full access to the entire 240 acres. It was something I didn't bring up in the presentation, but I will hear is that the one thing we did notice is as it got drier, so whether that be early in the summer in June or later in the summer in August, shade and water became more important than the burn patch. So um, that may not be an effect quite as strong in, as you move further north, but here where we break 100 degrees, uh, there's a picture I didn't put in there where we were out there sampling and all 30 cows are concentrated under one hackberry tree in the middle of the day where there's sun or where they're shade rather, and not and they're not outside of it. And so you can see that they didn't give they didn't care about that burn. Um, they were worried about shade at that point uh, and trying to keep cool. Um, this is more of an announcement from Evelyn Mertz. Um, she wanted to know, Tim, if you and I would be feel comfortable announcing they're planning a forum for prairie restoration practices on on April twentieth, twenty first. Yes. So yeah, Ella and I yeah, met the other day about that, and we are Tim's planning what? that. Lots of deep, lots of details still to be ironed out. Um, we've talked, I've talked to Aaron uh, Tejmelin from uh, Texas City Nature, with Nature Conservancy about this. And uh, I'm supposed to, I still need to reach out to Jaime Gonzalez and some other folks for the Coastal Prairie Partnership, but hoping to do some stuff with the Gulf Coast, uh, particularly focused on Gulf Coast Prairie Restoration um, later in April uh, for a bunch of practitioners. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here with um, one last. I'm going to take the control over this. There's or, a couple. Almost... There's still a couple in the chat too. Oh, there is. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. I missed so, uh, Brooke Best, just to clarify once more, was the same area either east, west or east pasture burned just the one time in two years of rest? No. So we were burning every. So basically, we broke the pasture into thirds. Every year, we're burning a third in both pastures and then sampling them. So we went. Or, so let's take the east pasture, for example. We burned the western third of the east pasture, then we burned the far eastern third, then we burned the center. Then we burned the western third, then we burned the eastern side, then we burned the center. And so, and, and we just keep going in that cycle um, as we're doing it. And so, when would you recommend to burn that same pasture again? The cycle we're on is every three years. So it's getting, it got burned in 2015, it got burned in 2018, and it got burned this year in 2021. 
So 2022 will be the far eastern side of the east pasture. 2023 will be the center portion, and then we'll be done uh, with that. So I'm not saying that's the optimal cycle. That's what we chose to do for this project to see the effect it would have. Um, you could rest it longer. You could graze it longer, and you probably have different effects. This is just what we did and what we the effects we had with the time we had. Uh, are ranchers given a financial incentive for burning like the California Winter Rice Habitat Incentive Program? So there is Oaks and Prairie's joint venture has a GRIP, the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program. They can cost share with landowners for doing prescribed burning practices if they're in their focal counties. Navarro and Ellis County are in those. This particular landowner did not get any incentive payment because he wasn't paying the contractor. Parks and Wildlife was doing it for him as a part of this research project. So that was sort of the incentive. Basically, he put in the fire breaks, we burn it. Um, NRCS also has cost share for that, and so does Texas Forest Service, various programs as well, if y'all are interested in that. Um, did you do any soil sampling or track any changes to soil, Evelyn? No, you know, it was one of the things we really wanted to do, but this was done with zero budget. All we had was time. Uh, and so it was just two biologists spitballing ideas. We're like, we should do this. We're like, yeah, we should. And so we did it. Uh, and then it kind of grew from there. Uh, luckily, we had Jason out there to help us the first year and get our minds wrapped around everything. That's we kind of, it was kind of survival of fitness in July when you were sampling anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we look more like mummies now when we're out there from <laughs> covering all of our skin and everything else. Um, I, one more question, I think, just popped up, maybe. So, uh, do you... Now okay, uh, how do you uh, uh, handle liability using fire from Bill Kirby? Maybe Sorry. read another question. Trying to read through all this. So, uh, Mr. Kirby, there is a, a most of the time, uh, if if folks have ranch policies, which most of them do, uh, prescribed fire is covered under that. As for us with Parks and Wildlife, as a state entity. Um, I would refer you to Chris Shank, who's our state fire program leader. He can give you some um, better inclinations there. But essentially, when we help private landowners burn, they are the burn boss. They are the ones who are still held liable. Uh, when we burn our own state lands, we actually, we're the only government organization, I think, in the nation that we have to have insurance coverage, and we do, uh, by state statute that was in, in put in a couple of years ago. If you've got more information, I'll give you, Chris, or if you'd like more information, I'm putting Chris's uh, name in there, but Chris Shank. Oh, I think I spelled his last name correctly. Um, you can reach out to him, and you can go from there. So, last another question. So, how long was your grazing period each year? Just growing season? No, they were. They could. We did not control it. So, some years they were in there for twelve months. Some years they were in there for eight months. Some years they were in there for seven. Um, some years, both herds from the west and east pasture were all in the east pasture. Um, we had no control. It was just uh, burn it and hopefully the plants respond well and uh, the landowner grazed it as he saw fit. We kind of gave him some feedback on what we thought would be best, uh, but he followed up with basically whatever management scheme he wanted. Again, we were trying to see if we introduce this one thing, can we move it in the direction we want it to go? And we sort of saw that. Um, and so I encourage everybody Great Plains Fire Science Exchange, if you can look that up, there are a ton of good resources and publications and uh, basically compilations of resource documents talking about prescribed patch burn grazing in there that are really good. There's a patch burn grazing working group that you can go to their meetings. I've been to Kansas and Nebraska to attend those, which is really great. It's all practitioners who are actually using it. Um, a lot of field tours, very little uh, classroom time, maybe an afternoon classroom time, and a lot of ranch tours otherwise, conservation lands. Um, and then beyond that, I'd also encourage you to look at Sam Fullendorf and um, Sam Fullendorf and Dwayne Elmore out of Oklahoma State University and all the stuff they have on patch burn grazing, a lot of good publications from them. And then again, also Chris Helzer with the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska and his Prairie Ecologist blog. If you search patch burn grazing, lots of good information on there on how he uses it to stimulate diversity and prairie resiliency and so on. 